Hello and welcome to this eighth edition of the Calcedon podcast. I'm Andrea Schwartz, joined by Calcedon President Mark Rushduni and Calcedon Vice President Martin Selbretti. Today is November 8th, 2020, and we are under a week from the general election that happened past Tuesday. And no doubt, if you're not somehow disconnected from all media sources, you have been bombarded with all sorts of opinions and facts and contrary facts. And so, as usual, the Chalcedon viewpoint is going to hopefully go beyond today and give a biblical perspective on our times and how we should go forward. And we're going to start with Mark, who is going to give us a bit of a historical perspective that this is not the first time something like this has occurred, and um, just to kind of get everybody's feet back on the ground. So, Mark, we'll give it to you. Well, things do seem a mess in many ways, and regardless of who is going to end up in the White House on, on January 20th, I think what's becoming very apparent is the division in our country. We are quite polarized in this country. And I think that part of the problem is that we don't have much that we agree on that draws us together. When I was a kid, I think there was a still something of a confidence, even a faith in government, too much faith in government. But people had respect for the institutions of government, and they believed that the, we were really moving generally in the right direction. Now, it's just a battleground. Politics is a battleground. Elections are more vicious than ever. And I see more of that ahead. We have very little in common in this country, not just politically. And as Christians, we realize that the lack of uh, unity is essentially religious. We Christians are used to the term worldview, and we see things in terms of our faith. I remember once my father saying, I was still a teenager when I remember hearing him say this, and many of the things my father said that I, I, I remember, I remember my age or where I was or what meeting he I was in that, that he was saying, and I can visualize the surroundings. And sometimes it was one comment he made in a meeting that I remembered that has stuck with me. And one comment he made once, and it's in, in his writings too, is that we don't have community and we cannot have community because we don't have communion. The root word of community is common. And that's at the heart of what communion is about. We have communion, the Lord's Supper. is What do we have in union because of the Lord's Supper? We have his redemption. And his redemption gives us a worldview and it gives our life a meaning and a purpose and a direction. And we don't share that with everyone in the world. Christians are even divided about what their direction in life is because they don't share a common Christian worldview. So if you look back at the nature of sin itself, we don't have any record of conversations between Adam and Eve until after sin. And the first thing they did was they showed division. Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent. In other words, there was, suddenly there was division because of sin. And Scripture tells us we're created in the image of God, and the Westminster standards refer always point that back as the catechism to knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, and dominion. And th this gives us something in common. If we share the idea of knowledge that we only can know because of God, and epistemology has been a big thing in my father's uh, writing in Chalcedon's and in Christian Reconstruction, righteousness, the idea of justice, morality— you have to have that in common. Obviously, a Marxist does not have the same morality as a Christian does because they believe in theft as a means to accomplish their ends and holiness being set apart. So Christians can have a communion and a community, and we, we demonstrate this in Christian communities quite a bit, but we don't have that in our geographical communities. We share a zip code, but often we share little more than a zip code. And so I think that's kind of the nature of the problem. And in saying that, I think people assume that non-believers are this monolithic opposition and enemy of Christianity. They may be opposed to Christianity, but that's their only real source of unity is what they're against because they're in rebellion against God. When men are in rebellion against God, they're really scattering in every direction. So the unbelieving world is really a lot of chaos out there. We see them as a unity because they oppose what we stand for. We are the common enemy, so to speak. But 
that's where we rely. And I, I don't see that changing until people change and people ultimately are not going to change through politics. We're not going to have unity through politics or through an election. We're only going to have unity ultimately through the power of the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't some people say, Martin, that there have been better times in our country than now? And wouldn't some of those same problems that Mark brought up be present, that there wasn't necessarily communion or community? So I think there are probably people who are feeling like we're on the precipice and this is all going to be over and, and you know, all those prognostications are going to come true. What, what's your take? Well, it's really a matter of who's in control now. And that's the Lord God, Jesus Christ, at the right hand of all power and authority. And he's the one who raises up kings and removes kings, sets them up and removes them. So that even that process is in his hands, regardless of what you see on the television or streaming. So if we try to look back and try to argue that things are worse than they are, it's really more that things have developed and evolved based on their fundamental principles. If you've already set in motion a rebellion against Christ, even in the intellectual level, as epistemology, as Mark was saying, that foundational seed sprouts. You're going to uh, reap what you sow. And so things that were sowed that give the impression that we were on a constitutional autopilot, say, or a biblical autopilot, uh, that autopilot only gets you so far before the aircraft starts to lose altitude and finally crash because it really had no substance, uh, substance of its own to perpetuate uh, uh, moving toward nirvana, toward utopia, if you will. Uh, the progressive dream is that everything's going to continue to move in the right direction. And what it actually is happening is that that progressive dream was in conflict with a, at least an earlier form of the progressive dream <laughs> as opposed to, say, a biblical uh, notion. And so these two different variations of the dream were in conflict with each other, and it came to the head with two different individuals. But we hear that when we go back in time, that uh, the kind of vicious political rhetoric is not new here. Uh, it, it goes back into the early 1800s, for that matter, uh, and certainly in Lincoln's time and, and beyond. This was not, for example, the very first impeachment, and uh, it's not going to be the last in all likelihood at the rate we're going. In other words, uh, political turmoil is baked into the system because this particular system rejects God. And therefore, since the Prince of Peace is not the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, they rejected the chief cornerstone, right? And they're going to build on sand. But that's the whole problem is that God says, you know, the stone that the builders rejected will become the head of the corner. So everything being built now that doesn't have Christ's head of the corner is doomed. It's not going to get anywhere. It, it is on borrowed time at best. And God's allowing it enough rope to hang itself with. And so we have to see it in, in terms of God's mighty hand over the situation. So the notion that this exact moment in time, which I call chronological snobbery, is, is the ultimate, the big one, doesn't actually fly. In fact, what it, it is, is it essentially establishes the idea of the existential moment being the only important moment. The past is already gone, <laughs> and the future hasn't happened yet. So anything that matters is right now. And this right now attitude is not the biblical attitude, though. The biblical attitude is future-oriented. It sees things in terms of the long view of God's kingdom and his purposes being resolved, and us either being part of that process or opposed to it, and therefore we'll end up on the junk heap of history, or we'll be part of the process, the stepping stones to the kingdom of God being realized on earth. And therefore we have communion with Christ, and that allows us to have communion with one another. Of course, that communion has broken down in a large part. We're going to talk about that further on in, in the uh, conversation here as we pull the, apart the details. I also want to make another comment about union in the first place. There's a very interesting book by Dr. Rushduni called The One and the Many. And throughout you see that there is this impulse by some people, the statists in particular, to try to create this union, this one, that everyone is one, e pluribus unum, emphasizing the unum, have this unity, if you will. And so this pull to try to create this oneness usually involves totalitarian state power in order to hold these pieces together. Because they encounter what Daniel talks about, right? It was a mix of iron and clay, and the two didn't hold together, and the peoples couldn't be forced together. And you have this issue when you try to unite Yugoslavia under Tito. It was a mix of iron and clay, in effect. And it was a force fit by totalitarian compulsion. And once that was released, it pulled back apart to the constituent nationalities. And so we have the same issue here, is that we're seeing the one in many being uh, put into motion here. People have a different idea of what the one should look like, and some people answer with the many. Let's just have a huge diversity. Let's just decentralize everything and go to anarchy. 
Uh, and sometimes we realize this in the streets, the anti flow movements and others uh, where they want to see civil union destroyed and, and in place civil disunion and every man a law unto himself. This is the one in the many concept of Aristotle come back to roost. It's usually put off on the side of philosophy, but Dr. Rushdie says it's actually far more fundamental. And he traces this all the way from pre-Christian times to the Roman Empire through the Reformation. And we realize there's stages where the, the state is turned into a god and the state the stages when it is de-divinized, uh, when the Christian position is taken into account. But when you have the state being seen as a god, as the source of that unity, uh, then you're going to be guaranteed that it's going to fall apart because it is a mix of iron and clay. The only thing that actually pulls everything together is Christ. In him, all things cohere. In statist uh, progressivism, they're supposed to cohere, but it's only by force. And ultimately, you quote uh, someone in a Star Wars movie, they'll slip through the fingers of the emperor, right? Because there's only so much that force can achieve when people decide that they're going to become anarchists and urge the many, the diversity over unity. And that's what we have today. So everyone's notion of what is supposed to be unified differs, and only the biblical position argued coherently, comprehensively, actually works, and actually is going to be what's realized in history. All other attempts are doomed because they build on sand. The Lord is not building those other houses. The Lord is not building the house so far as we can see here, and therefore, it's up to Christians to be building their homes so that the ultimate building blocks of the nation are, again, sound. And then we have a very, very different situation. And always when we see this kind of tumult, we hearken back to the discussion in Malachi 3.16. And people who feared God, they would talk to one another and they would consult with one another. And they would know what was God expected them to do and they would discuss it. And even these very quiet talks between them, God says, I'm going to write a book of remembrance about these men and women because they hunkered down and they tried to apply the law of God and they communed with one another at a time when everything was being torn to pieces. And this means something to God because they have become God's jewels. Uh, and God can use such men and women to, to create a newer future from that beginning. It doesn't seem like a lot to us, but to God it means everything. You know, back when I first was introduced to your father's writings, Mark, I gathered up all those position papers that he had written prior to when I showed up on the scene. And in 2017, we released a book called An Informed Faith that puts them all together. And I'm working through volume one. And I have to stop every now and then because I'm just amazed at how much he understood where his present day was going. I know when I read a lot of them at the beginning, I was like, I don't have any idea what he's talking about. Now I have a very good idea of what he's talking about because his prophetic sense of what where we were headed has kind of reached its, you know, I wouldn't say its culmination, but it's there. Did he ever tell you how he decided what things to talk about in his position papers? No, he didn't, uh, quite simply. Yeah, he, he was full of ideas. He didn't publish his first book till he was in, I believe, his mid-40s. And so a lot of his writings, his ideas, came from years of study, years of reading. And of course, he had a phenomenal memory. So a lot of this was percolating. And when he studied in one area, he began applying it to the others. But, but, but no, you're right. His ability to talk about how ideas were going to develop out and ha how present ideas were, were going to move into a more vicious state, they, they seem very prescient. And uh, it's a little scary at times, the extent to which he could see what was coming down the road and the seriousness of it. And you'd think when he saw as things that were getting worse and they were going to continue to get worse, and he said they were going to get you know, worse for a number of years, uh, even, and it's almost 20 years since he's passed away, he said things were going to continue to get worse for a while, but he believed that he was a post-millennialist. He believed that uh, you know, the kingdom was going to advance. Uh, he didn't believe evil was going to triumph. And so he had an underlying confidence because... It would be easy to be discouraged when you see the development of these bad ideas and their, their widespread acceptance. So, Martin, you have a pretty good pulse on what's happening in various areas of our country and the world in terms of Christendom. Would you say that 
we have a foundation laid at this point that there are people ready to build along the lines of what Dr. Rush Juni said? Well, the issue there is, do we have the character to be the generation that successfully builds that foundation? And that is an open question here in America. There's certainly good signs here and there. There's an entire movement, homeschool movement, that is indicative that parents at least are willing to take back government from uh, the civil government and apply it at the home in terms of education of the children, of preparing the next generation. So they're good indicators, they're good signs, but there's also some bad signs that are reflective of our character as Christians. And God is going to bypass a generation that has poor character. He, did, he had no hesitation doing this with the generation in the wilderness that uh, decided that the 10 spies who gave an evil report were the ones to be believed. And only Caleb and Joshua made it in across the River Jordan in one piece. Not even Moses crossed it, but those two men did. So we have, you know, some Joshua's and Caleb's out there, thankfully. But we also have a lot of people I think who might be not yet at the same level uh, in terms of having the character. So uh, what we must always do is put holiness and righteousness and justice up front and center and realize that we're on the hook for that. It's not as if we can just talk theological abstractions and uh, quote scriptures left and right as if it had no bearing on our actual walk. Our walk is going to determine what is the future going to look like for our children and our children's children. And where we are weak, then division will prevail even in our own families. Now, division is designed for a purpose. We even noticed that there was a one of the, uh, the Table of Nations in Genesis 10, 11, Peleg, was named division because it was the, the land was divided. Now, however you want to cut that continents being divided or uh, nations being divided, division is kind of endemic because the only thing that actually holds everything together is Christ. So all attempts to create a unity outside of that are doomed. So when we're saying the topic of our conversation today is division, Christians themselves are marred by division. And Dr. Reshtoni commented, he says, look, we're supposed to be the people of the Prince of Peace, so we should be operating in terms of that calling, and we should be bringing peace to all men, not being an agency by which division is furthered. We should be the healing component, right? We read about the Messiah, that he's like the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. This nation very much needs healing, but it sure wants nothing to do with Jesus Christ who has it. And a lot of Christians don't know how to apply the healing that Christ would bring because they don't know God's law which is the mechanism by which much of this healing is to be achieved, by turning toward him and not repudiating his law. But because the, you know, the point is, if you are observing some other law than the law of God, then you're an idolater in effect. You are essentially setting up the state as the mechanism. And now there's going to be division for sure, because Christ is the one setting division in the household at that point, setting father against mother and, and uh, two against three in the same household, as it says in Luke. That kind of division is because the entering into the law of God, the word of God, uh, essentially polarizes people. What's happening now is not that the word of God is polarizing people, but rather the word of man is polarizing people, which means that man's word has become a source of idolatry. We've elevated it, and we have de-emphasized the word of God. And until such time as Christians actually say, we're serious about the word of God, this is going to persist. I'll give you an example, Dr. Rashtuni, in his commentary on Corinthians, which I've been going through for quite some time. He has an exposition of uh, 1 Corinthians 6, and in that passage, it has the list of all those folks who are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Guess who's in the list? Revilers. Who are revilers? Rashtuni said it's those men who are continually judging other men. That's it. And what we have here today is Christians doing exactly that. They don't realize that they are, in fact, revilers. And there's nothing constructive about it. It's an artificial form of virtue signaling to revile things because you think this is evil. I'm going to revile this man or this movement or this church or that uh, institution. But you see, that is not the source of construction of anything. There's no reconstruction when you revile. It's simply a destructive process. It might have some part to play, but revilers in and of themselves get nowhere. And it's not the path to the future. It is in progressivism, because in progressivism, you have to identify and demonize an enemy. And by attacking that, that's all you essentially need to, to rally the troops around this new unifying principle. Hate this guy, hate this thing, hate this entity, hate this ism. But in Christianity, it doesn't work that way. We work with the Prince of Peace, and it's the kingdom of God that's going to stretch over things. And that's a whole different thing. And you need character to be able to withstand 
the kind of thing that the humans are throwing at us, the kind of things we see in the newspaper are very, very tough. And we are, need to be strong in the faith, the Christian faith, the biblical faith, the faith in what God is doing in the midst of this that says the waves will pass over us, but we will stand firm with Christ. So that's a matter of character. And I think some other nations may be farther along in this regard simply because they're used to persecution than we are who've been plagued with, of all things, prosperity, which is uh, harmful to us because we don't have the character to handle it. Therefore, right. we'll be able to even have that taken away from us. You know, Mark, I'm thinking about you preached on Nehemiah and Ezra a while back, and there were revilers in their day as they were doing the work of Christian reconstruction, although I don't think the Bible calls it Christian reconstruction. So, do you think that a lot of our issue is that we have, maybe with COVID and with you know the reliance on social media and we're going to get our information and this is how we're going to talk, that we have lost sight of working in our own local area so that our zip code is more than just what we share where our mail goes? Yes, we tend to, to focus on the wrong things. When people talk about problems, they talk about a lot often they'll, they'll conversation will gravitate to problems over which they have little control. And we're not responsible for things over which we have no control. But it's easy to describe what those solutions are because we don't have to implement them and we can't implement them. But there are problems closer to home in our churches, our communities, and we can be a witness there. And so, yeah, our responsibility has to, you know, be focused where we have actual power, where we can influence others. And uh, so it's, uh, we, we have to focus close to home. And sometimes this is, can be a, you know, a, a tremendous asset. How is a church perceived? I'm attending a church now that is having problem finding a place to rent because of the COVID. And we've discussed different facilities and one church, and they've been working on this for weeks. And I mentioned one church to them today and Nobody had even thought of that church because it's it's kind of an invisible church in this community. They have a fairly large building, but nobody could have could think of anyone they knew who went to that church. And it's just kind of off everybody's radar, which is a sad commentary on any local church that it's it's a church nobody even thinks about or remembers is there. And when Ezra and Nehemiah were there, there were some of the prophets too. Ezra and Nehemiah are historical books, really. But some of the prophets that were there at the same time, like Haggai and Zechariah, were telling the people, God's not going to bless you because you're not doing what you're told. You were told to get busy and you're making excuses. And their eschatology was one of their excuses. After they begun the temple initially, they stopped constructing the temple. They probably had a thousand things to do. They were probably very busy just rebuilding the infrastructure of Judea uh, because it had been everything had been destroyed 70 years earlier. It was just a tremendous amount of work to do just to get an economy moving again. And the prophet said, as long as you're not doing the work that God has set before you, you are not going to be blessed. I'm going to prosper you, but eventually I will accomplish my purposes even as he scolded them, the prophet scolded them for not acting. God said, yes, I'm going to bless Jerusalem. I'm going to do all I promised. But whether that generation was allowed to be part of it depended upon whether they were just going to do the work that was before them. And they weren't. They had stopped work on the temple. And their eschatology was part of the problem. Their eschatology told them that uh, the 70 years isn't up because they were figuring from the fall of Jerusalem. And it was just a few more years until that was up. And so if they figured from the first capitulation to Nebuchadnezzar, when Daniel was taken, uh, one of the first captives, the 70 years was up. So they were using their eschatology as excuse to do nothing. And we have the same problem today. Eschatology is very important, as is theonomy, because theonomy is the means by the rules by which we work, how we think, how we understand our ethical duties before God and other men. And so as long as we're denying God's law, we can't serve him. As long as we're not doing the work that is before us that is doable for us, God's not going to bless us in the big pictures that we like to talk about. So let me uh, dovetail. Mark is on the money by pointing to the books of Zechariah and Haggai. And I'd like to uh, 
draw attention to everyone to Zechariah 8. Because if you pay attention, you'll hear something very familiar about what's going on here. The first picture is depicted what's going to happen in the future, and it seems remarkable. It doesn't make a lot of sense that there'd be this kind of peace and union where it says, you know, the, the city will be a city of truth. There shall yet be old women and old men dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with a staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. And the Lord of hosts says, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people in these days, should it also be marvelous in mine own eyes, saith the Lord of hosts? In other words, just because you find it impossible to believe doesn't mean it's impossible. And then he specifies further in verse 9, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. For before these days, is interesting, before these days, there was no hire for man, in other words, unemployment was very, very high, nor any hire for beasts, neither was there any peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction, for I set all men, every one against his neighbor. But now I will not be unto the residue of this people as in the former days, saith the Lord of hosts. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give her fruit, etc. But at what point it says you have to make your hands strong and resume building the foundation of the kingdom of God. And at that point, then all these economic problems and the fact that every single neighbor is against his friend, his neighbor, everyone against each other, it's doggy dog, he's describing that. That is going to cease. And you have the situation described at the beginning verses about children playing in the streets and everyone in union and joy and peace and no affliction civilly on the nation. Uh, and that's going to be our lot too. But like Rashtuni uh, Mark here says, it is because of our eschatology that we don't take the steps necessary to, and we don't strengthen our hands to continue building what has been started with the apostles, with the Reformation, and to the era that we now live. Rather, our hands are slack, and the law is slacked too, for that matter. And so this whole passage in Zechariah 8 gives us the picture of what we're living in through right now. There's a promise set forth. It looks hard for us to believe, but God says, just because it's marvelous to you, incredible, doesn't make it incredible to me to make it come to pass. But the problem is you folks, my people, are refusing to uh, strengthen their hands and get to the task of building. That's why we name our uh, one of our organs, house organs that we publish, Arise and Build. It's actually a quote from the scriptures that we are to arise and build. And why? So that we can have the blessings that are described in the first part and set aside and leave behind us this area where there's no hire for man, there's no hire for beasts. Men cannot get, do anything because of affliction and because every man is against his neighbor. This kind of division is built into any nation that rebels against God. And the only way to overcome that is with brutal totalitarian iron-fisted rule. Otherwise, you it'll come to pass that it'll fall apart. And only in Christ does everything cohere. So the passages in the prophets are prophetic to us as well. And this is laid out in 1 Corinthians 10. All these things were said and happened to Israel as in samples unto us. And if we refuse to hear what the Word of God says in the Old and New Testaments, then we're going to repeat those mistakes, and we're going to be the ones who will not get to see that in our generation. But if we're willing to become stepping stones to that process, then the current divisions will become a thing of the past. But that's on us to operate in terms of what God requires, which is holiness and righteousness and justice and the building of his kingdom without apology and without compromise. And that's hard for us because it's very tempting to apologize and to compromise and to make an idol of things that we ought not. I also think that it's possible to need some correction in the opposite direction. And by that, I mean, there are a lot of people who say, we get the law, we understand the law, but people fight us on the law. And so, Instead of recognizing the Holy Spirit in people who need to be brought along, I think sometimes divisions happen because they just don't get it. So we take people who shouldn't be our enemy and we make them our enemy as opposed to treating them as brothers and sisters who we have something to share with. Could you comment on that, Mark? Because I know you're familiar with what I'm talking about. I'm trying to think of the word for it, and nothing's coming to mind exactly, but there is kind of a, a cloistering of people in their tiny little theological niches or ecclesiastical niches that, are, you know, our church is different from your church, and so they don't act as the body of Christ. And I think that's 
one of the problems of the modern church is that they are divided, that there is very little sense of the unity around the things that they do agree to. And a lot of that goes back to the fact that, that on some of the cardinal doctrines of the faith and the duty of the Christian as far as what does obedience look like, uh, there's no agreement. So it's the weakness of the church theologically and morally that causes people not to really know when should we work together and how can we work together and what does that even look like. And, you know, one of the great gains that we've made in the last half century has been Christian education. First, it was the day school and that morphed more into homeschooling. But there was a personal and family incentive to do that. And Christians had to go outside of their own groups to find other like-minded people. And as you recall, Andrea, early on in the Christian school movement, Christian homeschoolers got together a lot. And even local county homeschooling groups could be quite large. And that's largely disappeared now because there's so much material out there. People don't think they need to get together and share ideas. But they were searching for, for help from others. And that was a very healthy thing for the Christian school movement. It'd be nice if Christians worked together on some things. And again, uh, uh, abortion is an issue that a lot of Christians come together on because they see that as a common battle. And we're going to have to do that more and more in the days ahead. You know, I was in a group of believers not too long ago, and it's amazing how much of ideas that come from your dad, Mark, are now permeating pulpits. And you even hear a lot of these ideas coming out on Christian radio. And the the pastor was talking about how the early church said no to Caesar. And he could have, it's like he was reading from the book, The Atheism of the Early Church. So it was really encouraging. And then, of course, he goes on a little bit, and then now he's into a predisp- you know, premillennial dispensational sort of thing as well. And I think what happens to a lot of people, they hear, yes, oh, yes, he agrees. Oh, no, he disagrees. And instead of engaging, people are keeping score. And, and I think if more Reconstructionists who really get the law decided it would be okay to fellowship with other believers, we might see more of our ideas getting in place and suggestions of books that they might read. But I think that if we're going to make this headway, we're going to have to bite the bullet and realize that not everybody is going to be theonomic and reconstructionist and dominion oriented. You know, we have to work with who's there. Unity, so far as the New Testament is concerned, is an organic unity in the body of Christ. It's not a doctrinal unity initially. There's indications in the book of Isaiah, for example, that doctrinal unity is the last piece. That's the capstone that ends up after everything else. So Christ is looking to us to exhibit unity and fellowship and communion with one another prior to getting all the doctrinal ducks in a row. Now, we're not about talking about the essentials of the faith, uh, like the virgin birth and the atonement, et cetera, and, and the Trinity, the deity of Christ. But you know, the other parts that are not yet clear, we're making those a test of fellowship, and that is a dangerous thing. In other words, we're not acknowledging that for the time being, as the church is growing, that uh, doctrinal changes take centuries. It took till 451 AD before Chalcedon, the Council of Chalcedon, set forth the doctrine of the Christ in such a form that it couldn't be hijacked for totalitarian purposes of the making the state divine, uh, it basically set a barrier between the creator, creator and the creature once and for all. And that meant that Jesus Christ was the only divine link between creation, man, and God. There was no other link. There was no, The kings don't, aren't divine, et cetera, et cetera. That was huge. It took till the Reformation to get justification by faith pretty solid. And then, since then, we've had other fights we're having, uh, uh, and they're not yet resolved fully. Things about, say, the six-day creationism or about the uh, scriptures themselves. Modernism in the 19th century in Germany created a challenge that had to be addressed in terms of the authority uh, of the scriptures themselves. So each of these centuries brings its own battles, and it's all to the intent of us sharpening the toolkit that we have. And God is not 
resolved that this would happen with the snap of the fingers or by somebody simply saying, here it is, the Bible, we got it all straightened out. If you don't believe us, you're anathema. Now, some people have done that. The Roman Catholic Church obviously has done that with a whole host of ideas. Uh, but the reality is that that union, a doctrinal union, is going to come at the end because now God is looking for a different kind of unity for us. It's an organic unity it's the, or unity between brother and sister. It's the unity between the saints. It's the being compacted together, one faith, one baptism, as Paul talks about in Ephesians. And that is a very, very different thing. The, the content of the doctrine will fine-tune itself uh, over time. We're committed with consecrated scholarship, people working together. I think it's remarkable that the homeschooling movement had so many different denominations and non-denominations, even for that matter, by their own telling, working together with a common goal in mind, which was our children are not going to be raised by a Molech, by the state. And that is huge. It meant that there was a cross-denominational movement that was bigger than the denomination. If only we would see that God himself is bigger and that the kind of thing that he's planning, the kingdom of God, is bigger than our denomination. It doesn't begin and end at the church's door or the church's various instruments and symbols, as they say, the uh, creeds, et cetera, the confessions. Those are excellent starting tools, but they're not the be-all and they're certainly not the terminus. They are what gets us to the next stage, and we have to see ourselves as part of a progress. Not the terminal generation, to use Hal Lindsey's idea, title, but rather we are a primitive generation. We're still the primitive church, and we need to set things in motion for the next generation to be able to do better. And then the doctrine of the one and the many falls into its proper balance. It's not just unity at, at the expense of diversity or diversity at the expense of unity. They're both equally co-ultimate, to use Van Til's words, and Rashtuni echoes this, that they're both important. In Christ, we have both. And the, the Trinity has unity and diversity inside the Trinity. And all creation is supposed to reflect this glorious fact that you can have union and diversity simultaneously, and none of them overshadows the other. But you see, under statism, you can't get there. They always have to argue in terms of unity on our, on our level at any price or else. Whereas in the Christian system, we should not have, under biblical faith, a battle between the one and the many. We, of all people, should be able to say the one and the many coexist because they coexist in the Trinity, and reality is going to reflect the fact that the one and the many will be there. We'll have... In fact, it's expressed almost verbatim in Revelation eleven fifteen. 15, for the kingdoms of this world to become the kingdom of our Lord and Christ. It's singular there at that point, if you will. And so there's still kingdoms, plural, but they're also the kingdom of Christ, singular. See, so we don't have a problem with the, the one and the many being simultaneous. It's the uh, other worldviews that cannot grasp the concept of a true union. And therefore, division is guaranteed to them because they're trying to force it one way or the other, either to anarchistic terrorism or a monolithic state, a la 1984. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you made the comment earlier, I think it was you, Martin, who said that we're the victims of our own success or our own um, prosperity. prosperity. And I think, I think back in the mid-80s when I got my first computer and how long any processing took place. You know, I could start a process, I could go have a cup of coffee, I could go, you know, do the dishes, come back, and my thing was done. Now we have instantaneous information. And when we don't get it, we're really upset. And I think we don't have a long haul vision because everything has come or everything comes to us so quickly that we don't want to wait. You, you mentioned 451 AD and then the Reformation. That's a long time that happened between then. But I think we get impatient because we think if it doesn't happen on our timetable, it's not going to happen. Well, the kingdom of God is a glacier, and just because you can't see it moving and you're staring at it for a few minutes doesn't mean it's not moving and turn the entire world apart in its path, and that kingdom of God is doing exactly that. So glacial speed is not the key. It's rather the certainty of the end result, because it is a glacier that is inexorable. It is literally the irresistible force, and it's being applied to a world that's going to knuckle under, if you will, and be reshaped by it in terms of it, and that's what the kingdom of God is. By the way, one of the interesting sidelights of your comment about technology is that social media suddenly gives you the power to have up to 5,000 friends, say, on Facebook. How many of those friends are true friends? Are we? I just realized also that in the early days, people want to be my friend. Click, click, okay, okay, okay. 
And, and now I, I'm actually spend some time with every single request, taking a good hard look at it, saying, you know, in the past, I think I was a little bit saying yes, yes, yes to friends that were not really friends. It just created this artificial uh, notion that, hey, you have 3,600 friends on Facebook. And it becomes a competition almost. Right. But the, but the wiser people either did it very slowly and said, are you truly my friend? In other words, they put a high standard for friendship. And therefore, it's no surprise if you have a high standard for friendship that you're less likely to have division among those people that you name as friends and who name you as their friend. There's a whole doctrine of friendship in scripture anyway. And uh, we tend to take that lightly. And we did in the early days of Facebook. And now we have learned some lessons. Most people will actually go through the thing. I'm going through my annual purging of friends. It's not <laughs> just that it was uh, election driven. It's just that I have too many friends and I can't get friends that who want to, who actually are true friends of mine to come because I've, I haven't hit my limit. So these are artificial things that technology brings into play, and we should be mindful of the fact that this is artificial. It is not real. It is a technological creation. It's an abstraction. It's a number on a page, and you and sometimes you'll see your feed go by. And say, I don't know ninety percent of these people, honestly, and so you're trying to look for the ones that you actually know and are invested in their projects and in their efforts and in their trials and tribulations and, and triumphs. But that's not the way it is. So lots of times when we see people saying, well, I'm going to dump all my, un unfriend all these people. What does that mean really? Were they really your friends in the first place? Or were they simply things that you accrued over time by being careless and perhaps flattered by all the people saying, will you be my friend? So friend requests, most of them nowadays, unfortunately, have ulterior motives. And uh, we have to be more vigilant about that. Because someone who claims to be a friend who's not is a very, very good way to have something seriously wrong, a knife in the back sometime when you're not expecting it, because uh, we are not wise. And this is, again, a character problem. People like to have the idea that I got so many friends. And uh, it's a very, very different story now. So if there's division now in your friend list in Facebook, it might be because the, the friend list was flawed from the outset. And right. not simply because it was brought to light because of a political orientation today. And not only that, we've let someone else become the gatekeeper to our friendships. In other words, um, we have to go through this medium. How many people actually, hey, I'm going on vacation. I'm going to go meet my friend who lives in North Dakota, who I've never met, but we've had conversations and such. It all becomes through this platform which, as we've all come to realize recently, can be manipulated any way the owners of that platform want to do it. So we don't even have our friends if suddenly we're not allowed to be on this platform. Correct. Yeah, that's a danger that technology brings because every element of technology actually has an element of control built into it. It can't be because if you say, okay, I built this locomotive, who's going to buy and control the railroads that uh, lead it across the continent? Control is going to be part of that package. Is it a good control, positive control, or is it negative control? Uh, some people see it different ways. When they build the railroads, some people thought there was horrible things going on in terms of uh, sweetheart deals, etc. So everything gets politicized, including technology. And we shouldn't be surprised at that. It's very, very few people who are doing something simply because uh, they have an abstract notion that it's for the common good. Because ultimately, you have the tragedy of the commons, that someone's going to abuse it. Someone's going to say, well, if you let me have as many friends as I want, I'll friend everybody on Facebook, and I'll spam them with a whole bunch of advertisements to buy my new uh, sport drink. And so now, all the, all the bandwidth is used. So you have no choice but to actually restrict and throttle things, because it's not normal communication man-to-man, face-to-face. It is uh, uh, expedited by technology. It's bits on, in, in uh, light beams and going through fiber optic cables. And so that technology can pack a punch. And if we're not aware of the moral implications of these inventions, uh, we're going to fall prey to the various pathologies that they bring to bear on our waking life. There's people who cannot get to sleep without having spent a, an hour or two on, on screen time on their phone, checking things out, making sure everything's okay. Because right. they get their self-image from, uh, did people like this post of mine or not? And so this is tragic. This is idolatry. And idolatry is, and we covet of the people's uh, acceptance, if you will, on, on social media. So it becomes mm -hmm. the new arbiter of value. This is tragic. Right. So, Mark, when your dad started um, Calcedon and before, 
he would get in his car and drive various places or somebody would invite him to come and he'd get on a plane. And a lot of the lectures we have today come from very small meetings. These were not meetings, as far as I know, that had hundreds of people. We might have been talking about 10s, 20s, 30 people. And you mentioned that in the past, the homeschoolers got together and there were conventions Well, that changed, I think, a lot of it because of technology and people can be in touch. But do you think we should go back to something like that? That's difficult to say. I'm saying it's characteristic of the homeschool movement in that it is more fractured now. They don't see themselves as part of a movement. They're seeing it as something they do for their own family. They may have convictions about it, but they're not looking at themselves as part of a community. And you have to remember when people were meeting in large groups like that, homeschool associations were huge. That was the time when they were facing the possibility of persecution. And there was a lot of uncertainty about them. And it was a real pioneering movement. And people have have lost that. I'm not sure you can let, you can't go back on the road you came on. I mean, that's true of our history. We're not just going to turn back the clock Things have been moving too rapidly. People's ideologies have changed. We have a work in front of us that isn't going to look like the road we came from. And that's always true throughout history in all areas. And it can be very discouraging when you look at things and how bad they are. But I think God's people have always <laughs> been frustrated. There's a, I've often quoted the, the, the phrase that recurs in Scripture. It's even the martyrs in heaven in Revelation are quoted as saying, How long, O Lord? We, we, we'd like to see some resolution quickly. We don't like the direction that things are going or, the, or God's timing. And yet, if you look even at the, the gospel stories, if you, you pay attention to the history that was going on there, you could be very discouraged about that. So, you know, this Christmas time, we're going to celebrate the incarnation of our Lord. And we see that as a, as a hopeful, optimistic time. We quote the, you know, prophecies of Isaiah and, and others Uh, about the increase of his kingdom. But if you look at the time that he was born, Herod tried to murder him. Mary and Joseph had to flee from the murderous rage of Herod. When they were allowed to come back, they had to avoid his son, Archelaus, because he was ruthless. He was so bad, the Romans finally said, no more Herods, we're going to run Jerusalem because he was so violent and evil a man. The Romans thought he was trouble. And, you know, we're also told that, remember that the words that we just take as part of the Christmas story in the days of Caesar Augustus, uh, there was a decree. Well, Caesar Augustus, was that was the very beginning of the Roman Empire. The, the Caesars were ruling now as tyrants. The Republic had died. And just as the, the old Republic had died and tyranny began, Christ was born. The Messiah entered the world. And the Roman Empire had a lot of years of life left in it, a lot of evil. And, of course, the Roman Empire was used even as a means of judgment on Jerusalem in AD 70. So there was a lot of reason to be discouraged then. In many generations thereafter, there was a lot of reasons to be discouraged. But what happened to the gods of, of the Romans? They're gone now. and. There never been more Christians in the world today. Things are poised for the Spirit of God to move. Just look at China. It looked like the Christians were going to take over China in a generation. It looked like communism was going to take a step back. Well, there's come pushback from the Chinese, but God's kingdom will ultimately be vindicated in China and elsewhere and I think that the kingdom is going to continue to grow. So what we're seeing in, in our country, because we look at it as how does this affect us? How is this going to affect our, our you know, taxes in the next four or eight years? How is this going to affect my constitutional rights to do this or that? That small potatoes compared to the larger picture of the direction of the kingdom of heaven. And ultimately, humanism is failing. My father said there's this struggle because we're at the end of the age of humanism. They failed in one area after another. And things are a mess. Now, remember how in civics class, when we were in school, there was this optimism about what democracy and, and what our country could do. And look what democracy is doing now or what, what passes for democracy and democratic processes. People don't have the faith in it. They don't talk about 
it in the same way as they did then. The faith in science, very often scientists are held in contempt. Doctors were long regarded with respect. Now, with abortion partially, doctors are often suspect. People don't trust doctors or the medical profession. So a lot of things are coming to a head And I don't know if we'll see the resolution to them or if there'll be one resolution, but things are coming to the head. And that's the nature of how things work in history. People think, oh, things will come to a big head. There'll be massive judgment by God, and then we'll have this golden age. And I think that our our view of the Reformation, which was itself a long struggle that that was never completed, it leads us to, to think in these simplistic terms, and that's not how the kingdom has advanced through history. But it has advanced, and it's going to continue to advance. And so, and we're part of that advance, and we're part of its victory if we just serve the kingdom. I would also add that uh, one of the reasons that we have the kind of division that we have is that what humanism tries to do is always bring the final judgment here and now. Since it doesn't believe in a final judge, it then says that a concept of making all accounts right must now be transplanted from some transcendent God in the future to here and now. We need to have justice now, all total justice, complete justice. And the term for this is the day of man. It's actually a phrase used in 1 Corinthians 4, 3. Paul says, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. In the Greek, that's really of man's day, the day of man. There's the day of the Lord, which is the final judgment. And there's the day of man, which is trying to bring the final judgment into every single nook and cranny in every moment of life, because they need to have perfect justice now. Of course, they can't get it because their premises are false. They'll never achieve it. So it's a perpetual fraud that's perpetrated, if you will, uh, to achieve it. So we have to be aware that Paul is telling us how to deal with this situation. He's telling us, that therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. In other words, don't fall into the trap of those who trust in the day of man, in the day of man's judgment. Rather, give place unto wrath. Vengeance is the Lord's, and, and leave that for the final judgment. Dr. Rush Juni mentioned that there was a writing, rewriting, if you will, at the end of King Lear, if I recall correctly, so that it would have a happy Disney ending because people wanted justice now. They would not tolerate Shakespeare's notion that a final judgment at the end of time will set all accounts straight. This was not adequate to the mission. So they said, we have to have it now. And so this urgency to have the day of man verse and uh, bypass the day of the Lord and try to have perfect justice now is what, in fact, reeks of injustice and destroys everything. And so the faith of Shakespeare was supplanted with Spencerian notions that we need to have uh, perfect justice now. And we rewrite the ending of King Lear. And Disney did the same thing, for that matter, with The Little Mermaid and everything else that they got their hands on to put a happy ending on it now. And what does that mean? It means that we cannot tolerate God and the day of judgment, the end of history. We want to bring it in now by man's strength, by the hand of man. And this is the source of all the judgment and division because we are not content to be creatures. We want to be, capital J, judge over everyone else. Until Christians set that aside and say, it's not for me, I will serve him, and he is the total judge. He is our king, our lawgiver, our judge, and our savior. Isaiah 33, 22. If, and he fits all those bills. Anytime men take any of those hats and wears them, he is an idolater and he is doomed. And so that's why we see this kind of thing happening, that we have too much faith in the day of man, but not enough faith in the day of the Lord, which will set all the accounts straight at the end of history. All right. So Mark, you started off talking about different political eras and people thinking it was the end. Is it so terrible if the guy you didn't want ends up in the office of the presidency? Does it mean that the work of reconstruction can continue or might it actually continue more because there's opposition? Because biblical history is full of times where the children of Israel went into captivity and then they sort of woke up. Yeah, we can't be lulled into thinking that because the lesser of two evils, or however you want to phrase it, uh, might be in office, then things are, are well and good. Things haven't been well and good for a long time in this country. And I would say 
this country has been going downhill, heading for a crisis since before I was born, because our our grandparents had much the same conversation that we're having and the concerns that we're having many years ago, because they saw the change from their youth to their adulthood. In the 1950s, my dad said that he heard the a generation of Armenians who went through the massacres to compare the United States government to that of Turkey, that America was becoming another Turkey. Just because of the change they saw from the teens when most of them came over to uh, the 1950s, they saw America was heading in the wrong direction. It wasn't the America that they knew when they when they came here, and, and it didn't represent the, the future that they had hoped to see. But that's the nature of sin. That's the nature of how things happen when a nation turns away from God. It's going to get ugly. And it has been getting ugly in this country. We have been losing the rights that others gave us for so long. There is an erosion of any kind of protection against our most arbitrary of rules. Andrea, as you know, here in California, our government, our governor has makes the most absurd requirements telling people how who they can invite to Thanksgiving and how they have to behave at Thanksgiving dinner. Assumes he has the right to make those declarations. And that would have been considered a joke not too many years ago for any governor to, to make such, such a suggestion. And yet now it's just par for the course. And so, yeah, there's a lot of ways, reasons we could be discouraged, but we don't know how this is going to be resolved. If we have faith in the kingdom of God, then we know that the kingdoms of man have to suffer loss for the kingdom of heaven to see gains. And we know the spirit of God can change things very, very quickly. Even humanly speaking, history can change very quickly. I often use the example of the fall of the Soviet Union. Very common in many circles in the United States to say it wasn't really happening. It was just a trick. Because they had lived in fear of the Soviet Union for so long, they assumed the future was going to be controlled by the Soviet Union moving on to world communism. And that disappeared very, very quickly. And all and what replaced it was just a host of other problems. Right. So we can always find problems. But the fact is that we have the Holy Spirit on our side if we're serving the kingdom of God. One of the things that I'm constantly grateful for as I read the scripture now with greater understanding because of men like your father and other commentators, sometimes the greatest reward is understanding what's happening and and understanding that there is an answer. It may not be realized right now, but I think if people, instead of looking for this one great leader who's going to tell us what to do, to realize we have this leader who has told us what to do. And there's a lot of comfort in finding something you can do right in front of you. Don't you think, Martin, rather than having to find something so magnificent that it's going to affect 5,000 people at a time when affecting one or two people at a time is a big deal. Right. We've always spoken about the passage in Zechariah 4 where God's seven eyes, all the eyes of God, are on this little piece of tin that's on a tie to a string that uses a plumb line as rubbable to make sure the stones are straight. And so God's entire intense purpose is on the cheapest tool in the toolkit to do something very mundane. Are these stones straight? And yet there's God right in the midst of it, his entire attention focused on it. And it's because of that reason that we're told don't despise it as being work for his kingdom. No matter how modest or tiny, it all has its part to play. Two mites can do a lot. It can change history. We just don't know. As we were talking about division, I like I don't think we could end this discussion without at least bringing Dr. Rush Dooney's comments about division. I just quote here from him. He said, the, the Bible sees mankind divided into two groups, two groups. The humanity of the first Adam, the fallen human race, and the humanity of the last Adam, Jesus Christ, the redeemed human race. But the world doesn't want to see that kind of division and denies it in favor of races, nationalities, colors, black and white, red or yellow, whatever the case may be, political parties, I would add. The world has its own lines of division, even though it knows those are false. But the biblical line of division is between fallen mankind and redeemed mankind, and we must learn to live with the recognition that it is the only division. I think that is a good way to encapsulate the whole concept of division. It has its part to play, 
but there's a legitimate division. And so one that history is actually going to be bending toward in terms of purpose and final destination. Very good. Well, Mark, I agree. That's a great place to end it, don't you think? I think so. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening and we look forward to joining you again next time.